Let's return to a topic about which we recently talked for the first time. No, it's not Koryoshi Kurahara, nor the kaiju genre. Today, we'll be examining anarchism from a Japanese perspective. That Cinema Italia episode is paying off as we look at the 1970 magnum opus from indie director Kiju Yoshida, Eros Plus Massacre. While taking a look at our episode on Sacco and Vanzetti isn't necessary for understanding today's subject, we would encourage it as we spent a good portion of time in that video going over the basic philosophy of anarchism. The main characters of Eros Plus Massacre subscribed to a slightly different school of anarchist thought than Sacco and Vanzetti, though in all honesty, once more the politics of our protagonists actually figure very little into the film itself. For this reason, we won't be retreading the basics on anarchism in this episode. Eros Plus Massacre is the first of a conceptual trilogy from director Kiju Yoshida, sometimes known as Yoshishige Yoshida. While far from his first films, these three represent some of Yoshida's best-known and most well-remembered projects, with Eros Plus Massacre topping the bill, often lauded as being Yoshida's masterpiece. The trilogy, which doesn't exactly have a proper name, is linked through cast and crew overlap, as well as shared themes, namely an examination of political ideology in modern Japan. Eros Plus Massacre looks at anarchism in the 1920s and possible correlations with the revolutionary activities of 1960s Japan. The second film, Heroic Purgatory, deals largely with the leftist politics of the 60s, namely communism. The final film, Coup d'etat, examines Japanese nationalism and how it influenced the February 26th incident a failed military coup which we have discussed previously in our episodes on patriotism and Godzilla. Given how tenuous these connections can be, we thought it would be better to give each of the three films in the trilogy their space, and devote a full episode of Cinema Nippon to examining them one by one. We'll return in a few weeks to look at Heroic Purgatory, then in a few more weeks to examine Coup d'etat. We'll also discuss the connections between the films. Given Eros Plus Massacre's length alone, separating these films into individual episodes is probably the best decision we could make in this situation. You see, there are two cuts of today's film. The theatrical cut, which runs at about 2 hours and 45 minutes, and the director's cut, which clocks in at about 3 and a half hours. We'll get to the reasoning behind the existence of these different versions a bit later. Both cuts of the film are available, along with Heroic Purgatory and Coup d'etat, in a box set from Aero Video named Kiju Yoshida Love Plus Anarchism. Also on the set are introductions to the film and commentaries on select scenes by David Desser, the preeminent English language scholar on Yoshida's works and author of the book Eros Plus Massacre, which we've used for research on the Japanese New Wave previously. While we're at it, today's episode, as well as the two forthcoming videos, were recommended by Tucker Myers. Thanks for suggesting that we look into these films, as while we can't say that we fully understood everything we were getting ourselves into with them, we can certainly say that it was a unique experience diving into these for the first time. But just what makes Eros Plus Massacre so perplexing? Well... According to David Desser, Eros Plus Massacre, and by extension the works of Kiju Yoshida at large, most fully embody the ideals of the Japanese New Wave. We've talked a bit about the New Wave in previous episodes, most notably when we discussed Nagisa Oshima with Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence, but a brief overview would probably benefit us here. Essentially, the new wave was the result of the studio Shochiku deciding to take a risk and allowing young up-and-comers positions as directors, thus circumventing the long-standing tradition of working their way up in the company after years of experience as assistant directors. This was in an effort to reinvigorate their film output and infuse the studio's projects with a more youthful air that they hoped might help draw in a younger audience. What Shochiku may not have expected, however, was how readily and openly these young directors would bring their politics into their art, giving a voice to the student protest movements that grew throughout the 1960s. Whether they were protesting the re-ratification of the American-Japan Joint Security Treaty, or America's usage of Japanese land for deploying troops to Vietnam, or the manner in which their universities operated, this was a generation of political dissidents and this attitude bled into the art of the Japanese New Wave. 
Kiju Yoshida was one of the directors at Shochiku who was given the shot at the director's seat in 1960, alongside Nagisa Oshima and Masahiro Shinoda, two other titans of the New Wave movement. After only a few years in these conditions, however, most of the New Wave directors, including Yoshida, began to break off from Shochiku after beginning to feel like the studio was cracking down on some of their more radical liberties the young directors were taking with their jobs. As became common among this group, Yoshida opened his own studio, his being known as Gendai Egasha, just after turning 30. It was with Gendai that he produced most of his works moving forward, with Eros Plus Massacre being a co-production between Gendai Egasha and Art Theatre Guild. ATG, as the second company is often shortened, was a champion of independent Japanese cinema throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s helping the burgeoning market for non-studio films to grow as more new wave and avant-garde directors went to them for help with production and distribution. Enough background though, let's take a look at the subject of today's video itself. Eros Plus Massacre could be called a free-form docudrama concerning the lives and deaths of Japanese anarchists Sakae Osugi and Noe Ito. We say free-form because Yoshida's film does not concern itself with following a linear narrative. Rather, it freely associates events throughout the couple's life together, with the student movement occurring in the 1960s mentioned previously. Scenes will come and go without necessarily establishing where or when exactly they're happening, whether they're a dream, a fantasy, a retelling of the past, or impartial fact. Sometimes scenes will be juxtaposed between the two eras with their connection hinging on a shared action or thought on the part of the characters but rarely do these transitions follow what one would consider a typical narrative structure. Given the nature of the film's presentation, and especially that the majority of the historical facts present are spelled out fairly early on within the film's runtime, we don't feel the need to present a spoiler warning on this episode. Beware that we will be discussing the events of the film, but that what occurs on and off screen is not the end-all be-all of what Eros Plus Massacre has to offer. Rather, the film is more concerned with the questions that it raises regarding these historical events, and the nature of the medium of film as a whole. For that reason, let's dive into some historical background before getting to properly examining the film. Sakai Osugi was perhaps one of the best-known anarchist philosophers to hail from Japan. Early in life, Osugi became interested in socialism as well as political disobedience, which led him to spending several years in jail in his 20s. While in prison, Osugi began to consume a number of Western books, having learned several languages including Russian and English. The Russian connection here was perhaps the most important, as it was in prison that Osugi discovered the works of anarchist philosophers, notably Kropotkin, who we mentioned in our Sacco and Vanzetti episode, and who was considered one of the preeminent anarchists of the day. Osugi was so taken with Kropotkin's philosophy that he began translating his works and the works of other anarchists into Japanese, helping to proliferate anarchist thought throughout the country. Perhaps more so even than his beliefs and contributions to anarchism, however, Osugi is best known for his views on love and relationships. Osugi married Hori Yasuko in 1906. But as he became more involved with political radicalism, he developed some choice outlooks on monogamy and traditional relationships. Namely, when he met Ichiko Kamichika in 1914, he entered into a relationship with her as well. And in either 1915 or 1916, he also began seeing Noe Ito. Ichiko was a reporter for the Tokyo Nichi Nichi newspaper, who was noted for loving and supporting Osugi financially as much as she was noted for her jealousy. In 1916, in a fit of rage over Osugi's relationship with Ito, Ichiko attempted to murder Osugi, failing and winding up in jail for two years as a result. Noe Ito was a different story altogether. Ito was a remarkably bright young woman, having graduated high school during a time when this level of education was not only not compulsory, but also unusual regardless of one's gender. At 18, Ito traveled to Tokyo, where she joined up with Japan's newly founded Blue Stocking Movement. Blue Stocking is a name derived from the 18th century British Society for Well-Educated Intellectual Women. The name was adopted by Japan's first literary journal to be staffed exclusively by women. Blue Stocking was transliterated into Japanese as Seito, and the first issue of the magazine was published in September 1911. The editor at the time was Raicho Harasuka, a university graduate and translator of feminist literature. 
She founded Seito as a forum for frank discussion of taboo women's topics like contraception, abortion, and voting rights for women, among many others. Naturally, this led the magazine to experience a high amount of resistance from the contemporary government, which was expanding its empire and moving toward fascism at an alarming rate. We'll get to this in a soon forthcoming episode, but suffice to say for the time that, while the turn of the century had seen advancements in the rights of women, this was quickly reversed, with Seito remaining as one of the bastions of free-willed, politically-minded women in the capital, if not the whole country. Getting back to Ito, she quickly took to the ideals of Seito and became a writer for the magazine, expounding openly on her views of women's rights and the direction in which her nation was moving. In 1915, Raito Hiratsuka retired from the magazine, and Ito took over as editor-in-chief at the age of only 20. Within one year, however, the strain became too great due to governmental pressures and low sales figures, and Seito ceased publication. For almost a decade after this, Noe and Osugi lived together. They continued to translate political and feminist texts into Japanese, further decreasing their standing in the eyes of the government. Though this was still more than a decade before Japan's invasion of Manchuria and their involvement in the military actions leading up to the Second World War, the government, and more specifically the secret police, or Kempeitai, had little tolerance for those who stood as staunchly against their ideals such as Noe and Osugi. Not only were the couple's political views radical by the standards of the time, some have also hypothesized that their openly partaking in free love stood to degrade the traditional family model of Japan, around which the imperial system was structured, with the emperor serving as the father of the country at large. On September 1, 1923, a magnitude 8 earthquake struck Japan in an event which would come to be known as the Great Kanto Earthquake. Roughly 200,000 citizens of the country died in the event and large portions of Tokyo were completely razed to the ground. The Kempei Tai took the opportunity afforded by the confusion following this earthquake to clean house and murder any political dissidents that they found to be too troublesome. Supposedly, roughly 6,000 ethnic Koreans and Japanese political radicals were killed in the three weeks following the earthquake. Unfortunately for Osugi and Ito, Masahiko Amakasu, a lieutenant with the Kempei Tai in the area, ordered their arrest during this ongoing massacre. On September 16th, the couple was taken into custody, along with Osugi's six-year-old nephew. The three were beaten to death and dumped in a well. When news of this targeted attack got out, Amakasu was arrested by the military police and given a sentence of 10 years for abuse of his authority. However, when Hirohito ascended the throne in 1926, a special condition allowed prisoners like Amakasu to be released, meaning that the lieutenant only served three years of his sentence before returning to work with the military again on some less than savory black ops. Returning to Eros Plus Massacre, while present in the film, none of this information is relayed in a linear fashion. Some parts, like who exactly Raicho Harasuka is, or why or when certain actions are taking place, aren't even relayed at all. This is because, similar in some ways to last week's subjects, A and A2, the characters living in this world don't need to have these pieces of information explained to them. They're living it, so it's understood by them for the most part. It becomes a bit more complicated, however, when we begin to discuss the portions of the film that are occurring in 1969, as compared to those between 1916 and 1923. The woman who is arguably our protagonist in Eros Plus Massacre, Eiko, is a university student living in Tokyo. She and her male counterpart, with whom she shares something of a love affair, are researching the lives and deaths as just relayed of Osugi and Ito. The film thus juxtaposes the events of decades prior with the contemporary setting, in order to draw parallels between political dissidents under imperial rule and that in the then-modern day. As Yoshida himself states in an interview included on Arrow's release of the film, this comparison was partially motivated by what he called a lack of remembrance at the time of Osugi's and Ito's exploits. That's right, similar to Giuliano Montaldo's aims with Sacco and Vanzetti, Eros Plus Massacre was designed to inspire conversation on the part of an audience at home about events which were being forgotten. While today the names of these anarchists may be fairly well known, Yoshida seems to imply that when the film was released, audiences may have been unaware that history could have been repeating itself. In order to draw attention to this, then, he sought to integrate the two settings. 
What results from this juxtaposition is some of the most striking photography we have perhaps seen up to this point on the show. Cinematographer Motochiki Hasegawa and director Yoshida make notable use of stark lighting, especially given the black and white format. But what's perhaps more remarkable is the aesthetic of the film. One could easily argue that placing characters in period dress within modern Tokyo was a constraint of producing an independent film at a time when such a thing was still a rarity. But we would tend to agree with Desser that, whether this was a constraint or a conscious decision, it turned into a brilliant visual motif. This is because, since the narrative is more or less being explored by contemporary university students, it makes sense that their internal image of Tokyo is the one that they have grown up knowing. It's easy for them to imagine the clothing that Osugi, Ito, and others would be wearing at the time, given that photographs of them have survived. But capturing the atmosphere of the world which they inhabited, a Tokyo which was literally destroyed just before their deaths, is another matter entirely. In this manner, the film not only draws parallels between the political dissidents of both eras, it actively challenges the viewer to consider how historical accounts are portrayed. More than once, the students that we follow express how the past is dead, and how we ought to just forget about it. At another point, Eiko is captured by a police officer who proceeds to interrogate her, forcing a confession of being a prostitute out of her. A film director with whom Eiko has a sexual encounter early on is later seen telling two women who he films while criticizing their acting, you're beautiful models, not humans. What we are presented with here are two opposing worldviews. There's the nihilistic view of the college students, as well as of Osugi, who believe that nothing has any inherent value, and thus that subjective experience is truth. Others like the police officer, meanwhile, have made careers based on empiricism, and thus believe in the value of facts and the existence of objective truth. Whether we're taking the film as one view on the historical events presented, or as a call to attention concerning the nihilistic view of objective reality, we can see that the film is permeated with inconsistencies. Not only is the narrative fractured and seemingly displayed at random, but the visual space is often confused. The most notable and most common example of this in theoretical terms is how the 180 degree rule is broken repeatedly. For those who aren't aware, the 180 degree rule is a piece of film theory that dictates how the camera should stay on one side of an imaginary line within the frame. If you have two characters opposing one another and speaking, you're allowed to position the camera wherever you want. But once you pick one side of the space that they occupy, you must remain on that side to prevent confusion on the part of the audience. One of the more experimental, subtle manners in which Eros Plus Massacre seeks to boggle the mind is by placing the camera wherever it pleases, with no love for conventions of cinema like the 180 degree rule. Thus, we might not recognize it consciously, but the film allows us to notice that sometimes the space of the film, just like the time of the narrative, doesn't exactly make sense. This serves to break the illusion that we're watching a true account of these events, and instead calls attention to the fact that we're watching a film, which is something that could be called a cardinal sin of narrative filmmaking in and of itself. Yoshida explains in the previously cited interview that he sought, through breaking expectations in this manner, to not create a record of Osugi's and Ito's life together, but to in fact recreate their murder itself. He says that the Great Kanto Earthquake occurred 10 years prior to his own birth, and that as such, he couldn't hope to do justice to the events as they actually happened. Yoshida holds the philosophy that any retelling of historical events is inherently fictional for this reason, that it's a projection on the part of the historian or artist, regardless of their relationship with the event that they're portraying. Thus, in eschewing any attempt at authenticity in terms of visual setting or even linear storytelling, he is simultaneously embracing his version of these events, calling attention to parallels between what was happening in the 1920s with the 1960s, and pointing out to the audience that he's not attempting to fool them into thinking that what they're seeing is historically accurate beyond what could be called the immutable facts of their lives. That might sound convoluted, and in truth it is, given that Eros Plus Massacre doesn't exactly play nice with conventional film rules. Rather, it uses its own logic, but like other great experimental and avant-garde works, it's so dedicated to its own sense of internal reason that it just 
works. It's not the type of film that will be appreciated or even necessarily enjoyed by everyone. But as those who enjoy it will attest, if you like Eros Plus Massacre, you kind of really like it. Unfortunately for Kiju Yoshida, even from the get-go, not everyone liked it. Ichiko Kamichika, the mistress of Osugi, who we briefly mentioned earlier, actually survived the fallout of the Great Kanto Earthquake, living until the ripe old age of 93, and serving four terms in the National Diet as a representative of the Socialist Party within Japan. In 1969, after Yoshida had completed the film, Kamichika requested a private screening before it was set to be released. Outraged at Yoshida's portrayal of her, she refused him the right to release the film on the grounds that it constituted an invasion of privacy. Yoshida then cut almost an hour of material from the film, most of which revolved around Kamichika. He also renamed her character to Itsuko Masaoka, in order to perhaps avoid further conflict. Kamichika remained obstinate, however, and in fact filed a lawsuit against Yoshida for the aforementioned invasion of privacy. In the end, Yoshida won the court case and was allowed to release the film to theaters. However, the film that was published was the cut-down version. It wasn't until 2002, almost 25 years after Kamichika passed away, that the completed film was released on DVD, marking the first time that it was shown publicly. However, due to damage to the only film copy of the project, even this director's cut is missing nine minutes of footage, which is now considered lost. In his commentaries for both versions, David Desser can't seem to decide definitively which cut of the film he prefers, stating that both have their own merits. In our opinion, the shorter cut is better paced, while the director's cut clarifies some of the ambiguities that remain within the theatrical version. However, while it clears some things up, it adds additional questions and characterization not raised in the three-hour version. Once again, we'll have to agree with Desser on this one and say that you might do better than taking our advice and watch the film yourself to decide which cut you prefer. As stated before, it's definitely not a film for everyone, but if you're willing to put in the mental legwork, Eros Plus Massacre can be quite the engaging watch, in addition to being visually striking and flat-out bizarre at points. We'd like to thank Redabrek and Rogo once more for research assistance on this episode. Be sure to check out their links in the description, as well as the citations for this episode, which contains several books detailing the lives of Raicho Hiratsuka and the Seito movement as well as the anarchist movement in early 1900s Japan and the connection between Japanese anarchists and their Russian contemporaries. There's a wealth of information in there that didn't fit into this video, so be sure to give all of that a look. And while we're at it, be sure to check out Arrow's Love Plus Anarchism set. In just a few short weeks, we'll be back to talk about Heroic Purgatory, so feel free to go ahead and watch the film before you hear us explore its potential meanings and real-world connections in depth here on Cinema Nippon. Until next time, everybody. Returning to Kiju Yoshida's political trilogy, let's examine the follow-up to Eros Plus Massacre, Heroic Purgatory. Where the first film looked at the philosophy of anarchism in pre-war Japan and its potential links with the post-war youth culture, Today's film turns instead to the leftist undercurrents of said youth culture. Namely, Heroic Purgatory deals largely with communist activism in the 1950s, 60s, and the future of the 1970s. Heroic Purgatory has been called the most confusing of Yoshida's trilogy for several reasons. It is perhaps the most experimental in terms of photography, with Yoshida and the cinematographer Motokichi Hasegawa taking the lessons learned from Eros Plus Massacre and pushing them further into bizarre territory. The film deals with a cast of often unnamed doppelgangers, with the narrative flowing like a dream between past, present, and future, where its predecessor attempted to blend its contemporary setting with actual historical events. Heroic Purgatory uses fictional characters to describe an actual political movement over the course of nearly two decades then postulates on where that movement may head in the following decades. Rather than displaying its contemporary characters' takes on the past, we track the same cast throughout the period, albeit with little reverence given to clarifying setting in terms of time and space. 
Heroic Purgatory is a fascinatingly confusing film, and will likely prove to be the most frustrating of the trilogy for some viewers, while others, like me personally, will find it to be almost the most rewarding in terms of pathos, visual punch, and captivation. The action of Heroic Purgatory is split mostly between three periods, 1952, 1960, and 1970 onward. As we said previously, the film deals with communism and leftist politics at large during these different periods. Each of these years holds a real-world significance, an examination of which would likely help us in understanding the goals and messages of the film. The first, 1952, was the year in which World War II formally ended. While active conflict on both fronts of the war ceased in 1945, this year also saw the beginning of Japan's occupation by America. Over the following seven years, the Allied forces, under the direction of General Douglas MacArthur, oversaw the reconstruction and restructuring of Japanese political and social life. As we've discussed in previous episodes, this period saw a number of major changes, reaching from the highest echelons of society down to the everyday lives of civilians. Where the government prior to and during World War II sought to repress all anti-imperial or non-nationalistic ideologies, the occupation forces stressed a policy of implementing democracy. As a result, and likely in order to promote goodwill among the citizenry of Japan, MacArthur ordered that political prisoners of the previous government receive general amnesty, and that leftists be allowed to express their views openly. The Japanese Communist Party was founded much earlier, in 1922, but was almost immediately disbanded by the imperial government. As soon as all the jailed members were released, they reformed their party in 1945. This reformation, as well as the amnesty under MacArthur, led to a national increase in the number of communists and other such leftist ideologues within the country. Ironically, the spread of communism elsewhere would be part of the reason that the Allied forces removed themselves from the country in 1952. But by the time that America was starting to fear the Red Menace, this ideology had already taken firm root within Japan. Today, Japan's Communist Party remains one of the largest non-ruling communist parties in any country globally. Regardless of how far Japan's reconstruction efforts may have come by 1952, the first important setting in heroic purgatory, this year saw the escalation of another important Pacific conflict into which America had already been drawn. Several years prior, when Japan surrendered to the Allied forces in 1945, Japan's imperial holdings beyond the islands in their immediate vicinity were released from Japan's power. This included Japan's interests in China and Korea, the latter of which Japan had officially annexed in 1910. Almost immediately, communism began to spread into the nation, when the Korean peninsula was divided into two parts, with the Soviet Union occupying the northern portion and the Americans taking the south. In 1950, troops from North Korea invaded the South, initiating the Korean War, one of the earliest proxy wars to occur during the Cold War. Essentially, this meant that America, due to both its interests in South Korea and in stemming the spread of communism, felt it necessary to send troops to fight in the Korean War. Due to the amount of manpower the Americans had required for the occupation of Japan, this naturally meant that a period of drawing down was necessary. Thus, with America entering the Korean War in 1950, this precipitated the need for a formal end to the occupation and World War II within Japan. On September 8, 1951, the Treaty of San Francisco was signed, officially ending the war and the occupation, with an effective end date set for April 28, 1952. This meant that in 1952, the Japanese government once more assumed sovereignty over its lands and citizenry while the Americans moved on to the conflict in Korea. Thus, the rampant leftist ideology of communists, anarchists, and socialists were allowed to run wild in what would become one of Japan's most tumultuous periods in recent history. With the bilateral support of working-class citizens and university students alike, the leftist struggles of the period were destined to become the stuff of legends, thanks again largely to the influence of MacArthur's Western democracy. Prior to this period, Japanese universities were more or less compartmentalized organizations in terms of structure and control. 
Though some were private institutions and others were state-funded, all were more or less exclusively run by boards of officials put in power by the schools, their owners, or the government. In the late 1940s, the seeds of political dissent among the student population of Japan were sown, with the formation of Zen Gakuren, a contraction of the name Zen Nihon Gakusei Jichikai Sorengo, which translates to All Japan League of Student Self-Government. As you likely guessed from the name, this organization's rise to prominence saw a takeover by university students in decisions concerning their schools. This rise came following the effective protest of Zen Gakuren's founders. Seeing how the political tides were changing under the occupation, universities quickly acquiesced to Zen Gakuren, more or less arguing that students ought to have a say in the leaders and rules of their universities. Zengakuren was instrumental in a number of student and labor protests which occurred throughout the 1950s and 1960s, thanks in large part to the massive number of members who took part in the organization. Due to the age of the university students at large, and how disenchanted they were by the prior generation, given how the Japanese government had operated so strictly for the prior decades, Zengakuren became a breeding ground for communist and anarchist thought the former of which explains their shared ground with the communist movement among blue-collar workers who sought to oppose Western-style capitalism. Together, the students and the working class opposed, among other topics, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and perhaps most notably, the Japan-U.S. Joint Security Treaty. On the same day that the Treaty of San Francisco was signed, September 8, 1951, the perhaps more famous treaty was also signed. Among other provisions, the security treaty made it such that America was allowed to intervene during any conflicts within Japan. Additionally, it stopped Japan from becoming a belligerent party in any armed conflict ever again, with America agreeing to assist in Japan's protection should Japan be attacked. By the time this security treaty was signed, Zen Gakuren had already grown quite influential within Japan, and mass protests were set up by this organization. As would be the case with their later war protests, Zengakuren saw the treaty as a sign of American imperialism, essentially that it neutered Japan's sovereignty while allowing America to use Japanese soil for its own gains. In the scenes from Heroic Purgatory set in 1952, we observe a small group of students meeting in back rooms of presumably universities, plotting their various schemes. They hope to ultimately disrupt the political process of the early days of the security treaty. Their endgame is to kidnap an ambassador, about whom we ultimately learn very little. But the names are not important here, neither for the potential kidnap victim nor for the students themselves. Rather, we're more drawn to the use of the students' language, which is largely devoid of naming. Instead, all of those within the conspiracy are one another's comrades, and the boogeyman of a spy is brought up several times. The first is important because, though heroic purgatory is about communism and leftism, we're never told this directly and instead have to glean it from the vernacular of the group. The latter is important for reasons that we'll get into in just a bit. Spliced throughout these 1952 scenes are two other sets, those in 1960 and those set between 1970 and 1980. We place these latter two in the same category because they compose a relatively small portion of the film compared to 1952 and 1960, and they ultimately serve a very similar purpose. Moving forward, we arrive at 1960. This year was important for the actions of Zengakuren and the leftist movement within Japan at large due to internal strife and, once more, the Joint Security Treaty. The original 1951 Security Treaty contained a provision that it would need to be re-ratified every 10 years, continuing the working relationship between Japan and the United States. However, the initial re-signing was not set for a full decade later, and instead for 1960. You can likely imagine at this point why the later settings for the film fall even decades apart. Due to the efforts of Zen Gakuren and their blue-collar comrades, the 1960 treaty actually turned out a little different when compared to its 1952 counterpart. Namely, the allowance on the part of the US to intervene in any conflicts within Japan was rescinded. However, this was a small victory for the group, as the 1960 treaty still allowed the United States to hold military bases in Japan, as well as barring Japan from declaring war. As you might imagine, this year saw protests on the parts of leftist activists 
and in fact these protests were larger and more violent than their 1952 counterparts. The number of citizens showing up to these events was increased, but Zengakuren had also begun to splinter, with three primary factions coming into existence. One aligned itself with the Japanese Communist Party, while the others disavowed the JPC and subscribed to different ideologies from one another. Throughout the coming years, these organizations would splinter even further into an unfathomable number of truly confusing, sometimes interlocking, sometimes opposed groups. For the purposes of 1960, however, the movement had its best year ahead of it before slowly decaying. In Heroic Purgatory, we see 1960 as a more pristine version of 1952, where before we saw our conspiratorial group meeting in broken down, cramped rooms, we now observe them in relatively large, monochrome spaces. The grime has been scrubbed off, and we're seeing a more organized, more official version of our communist protagonists. This is the movement at their height, and yet their basic plan of attack remains the same. 1970 was the year in which the film was produced and released, as well as the second instance of the Joint Security Treaty needing to be renewed. As the historical record shows, the protests against the treaty at this point were expected to be even larger and more aggressive than those seen in years prior. But, in fact, the movement had become too fractured to do any real harm against the government or its policies. At the time of Heroic Purgatory's production, however, this type of hindsight wasn't available yet, meaning that it presents a bizarre portrait of expectation on the part of Yoshida. However, unlike the hopeful attitude that perhaps a younger director may have taken, Yoshida presents the 1970 scenes with a tinge of cynicism. In this vision of 1970, our earlier heroes have become aged, though it's not immediately obvious visually with all of them. A new group of university students have taken up the cause, while the older generation have moved on. As we mentioned before, the names are not important, which in fact drives home the first major point of the film in our opinion. By following once more the same plan of kidnapping an ambassador for political reasons, but only assigning him a letter rather than a proper name, Yoshida draws parallels between the movements of the earlier times and those of 1970. Again, most of the comrades aren't even properly named, instead merely being called comrade by one another. One notable difference, at least through the eyes of the latter generation, is how much more violent the university students have become in 1970. Similar to how the actual movements of Zengakuren had escalated throughout the 1960s, we see this escalation represented hyperbolically through their use of guns, and how much more flippantly they use the term spy than their elders did, which we mentioned before. Now we can get to that point. Through showing these similarities among generations, Yoshida is calling attention to both the cyclical nature of political activism and what he might have seen as the ultimately negative end to the path down which these comrades traveled. On the first point, he is showing that, though times may change, ideology doesn't fluctuate too much. The names merely change. By removing the names wholesale, or at least saying them rarely enough that we never learn them, we are shown that the struggle among these leftists throughout the 50s, 60s, and beyond was a constant one. Even how the students look and dress is remarkably similar among the groups. Though the revolution would never truly come in their favor, they fought for it more or less non-stop, with new people coming of age all of the time to take up the fight. Early on, in fact, this level of guts was looked upon with favor by employers in Japan. During the 1960s, those seeking employment right out of college were almost guaranteed a job if they had taken part, especially a prominent part, among student activists. It was thought at the time that these individuals showed a good level of initiative, and an ability to stick to their guns. However, when some of the more violent elements and splinter groups began to emerge throughout the decade, this policy began to lax and in some cases even reverse. By 1970, those who were taking part in protests began to see trouble when seeking employment after university, which indicates the type of change we see in attitude within the groups of the film. These violent leanings lead us at last to the bit about the spies of the film. Of course, the leftists are opposed to all things relating to what they see as American imperialism and nationalistic right-leaning ideology. In this manner, they have a set enemy, so to speak. 
the monolith of Western Empire that they can constantly fight against. But Yoshida is showing us through the incorporation of the spy that when the students don't have someone to actively fight, they will find a new enemy with whom to pick a fight. We're never given a clear indication as to whether anyone within the groups presented is in fact a spy working for the government to disperse communist conspiracy. But those among the groups, and especially the 1970 group, flaunt the threat of someone being a spy openly. Whenever something goes wrong or someone gets anxious enough about the potential for issue within their plots, the issue is raised again and again that someone within their inner circle must be a spy. This makes it so that, effectively, no one can truly be trusted, with Yoshida drawing our attention to the faulty structural integrity within the student movement. And this is why we say that Yoshida had a cynical approach to the movement, because he lived through the 1952 and 1960 protests, and saw the fervor with which the students and workers protested and fought. By the time 1970 came around, he recognized how much of the culture of these same groups had changed, and yet how the ideologies had remained the same. Through heroic purgatory, and especially the final portion which we're about to discuss, Yoshida sought to examine the motivations behind each of these groups, and whether there was enough integrity remaining within the left to move into the future. Moving into the future, some of the most striking scenes of the film take place somewhere between 1980 and 1990, the future contemporary to the film. What's notable about these sequences right off the bat is that Yoshida saw fit to include them, further solidifying the idea that movements like those of communism might not end for the foreseeable future. By the time of the film's release, the Joint Security Treaty had already been re-ratified for 1970, but with these scenes, we see a new take on the student movement. Rather than the cynicism of the 1970 scenes, Yoshida instead looks to the future with a sense of resignation, and, in some ways, hope. By this point, the youth have become even more violent, with their methods arguably having little to do with the ideology that they believed in from the beginning. Meanwhile, the older generation have entirely aged out of activism, and have instead become successful members of society at large, a fact we've now been following since the scenes set in 1960. By now, though, they've established their legacies and have little interest or even energy for such frivolities as activism. In one of the final scenes of the film, the man who we've been following almost entirely throughout is asked by a reporter what he wants to be in life, more or less. For the first time, he drops all political pretense and merely says that he wants to be a good husband. It's a sobering scene, emotionally driven home by the dreamlike imagery that we've been wading through up to this point. What's notable here is that, unlike the deaths of our main characters in Eros Plus Massacre, which come relatively early in that film's runtime, this scene occurs toward the close of Heroic Purgatory, indicating that Yoshida meant it to punctuate one of the main themes of the film. While this analysis doesn't really get into the frankly bizarre imagery of the film with its asymmetrical framing, its use of doppelgangers, its shifting from film to borderline stage play territory, nor the impossible architecture of its visual spaces, we hope that we've gotten to one of the main points of heroic purgatory. Eros Plus Massacre was a film about the politics of anarchism in Imperial Japan, and how leftist ideology and free love were oppressed in the age of fascism while heroic purgatory looks to the cyclical nature of leftism, once it was again let loose within the country. It's a much shorter film than its predecessor, and I would argue it's actually the better of the two. It's much less slow and plodding than Eros Plus Massacre, and it functions on so many levels, as a cautionary tale, as a mystery, as an impressionist masterpiece, in some ways even as a horror film. Heroic Purgatory is confounding and bizarre, and it might just be the best of Kiju Yoshida's political trilogy, but don't let that stop you from watching the third one, which we'll be getting to very shortly. Closing out our examination of Kiju Yoshida's political trilogy, let's jump several years beyond heroic purgatory and several decades before the student demonstrations of the 1960s, to look at 1973's Coup d'etat. Where the first two films in this series deal with the political left, today's film could be said to be their diametric opposite, 
turning to focus on the far right. However, as we will soon learn, the far right during the period examined in coup d'etat might appear rather unfamiliar to its present-day counterpart. We've spoken at some length on more than one occasion about the February 26th incident, the failed military takeover that serves as one of the tentpole events of coup d'etat. With Yukio Mishima's patriotism, we looked into a story that took part in the periphery of this notorious event. While in discussing Godzilla, we looked into how the February 26th incident impacted the lives of soldiers not directly involved with the coup. Similarly, Yoshida's 1973 film examines the background of the event rather than the exploits of those attempting to install a military government in 1930s Japan. As with Heroic Purgatory, Yoshida here foregoes displaying the events of those fateful days, referring to them through narrative ellipses and instead training his cinematic eye on the most instrumental figure who did not directly participate in the incident, Iki Kita. Ikikita was a notorious political philosopher of the early 20th century, and it's through his eyes that we witness the rise of right-wing nationalism and fascism in pre-World War II Japan during the runtime of coup d'etat. Born in 1883, Kita spent a good portion of his formative years as an ardent socialist, advocating for social change in Tokyo during the late Meiji period. However, by his late 20s, Kita had grown disenchanted with the socialist cause, arguing that no true revolution could happen within Japan through this system of beliefs. In 1911, he moved to Shanghai, where he would remain for roughly a decade. During this period, China was undergoing their own onslaught of revolution, something which would prove immeasurably influential on Kita's political beliefs. Even in 1906, when Kita published his first book on socialism, detailing his beliefs earlier in life, he profoundly rejected the ideals of communism. In his mind, while socialism was originally reasonable, Marxist thought was more or less useless and overly idealistic. Thus, witnessing the uprisings within China during the early 19-teens served to push him further from communism, and more towards the political right. Through these revolutions, Kita saw the political might that could be wielded by a people if they militarized and sought sovereignty within their own nation. These experiences would lead Kita to believe that, were Japan to truly advance as a nation, it would need to be a nation of its people. You might be scratching your head and thinking that that line of thought sounds fairly similar to socialism or even communism, but we'll get to the finer points of why this is not the case in just a moment. Kita was born about a decade and a half following what was known as the Meiji Restoration, which was a fundamental governmental shift within Japan. This revolution, named after the reigning emperor of the time, saw the end of the samurai, the formation of a standing army, and the restoration of power to the emperor of Japan. You see, during the preceding centuries, the government of Japan was ruled by the shogun, a military leader under which the samurai policed the country. During these tumultuous times, the emperors were seen more as figureheads and were in fact used in a number of instances as bargaining chips during power struggles between rival clans fighting for rule of the nation. Having grown up under the rule of Emperor Meiji, Kita idolized the man as a symbol of all that was right within Japan. However, he also saw the government under Meiji as an oligarchy, meaning that legal decisions were made by a select few rather than a single person in the case of dictatorship, or the people at large, in the case of a republic or a democracy. This led to Kita's early interest in socialism, under which power would be theoretically more evenly spread among the citizens of the nation. It also led to Kita advocating for universal male suffrage, though notably not women's suffrage due to his belief in what he saw as traditional Japanese values. As Kita saw it, an oligarchy like that which existed under Emperor Meiji was prone to corruption. In his mind, the emperor as the father figure of the nation should know what was best for his subjects, while the people at large should be able to have some agency in how they lived their lives. What's more, further pushes under Emperor Meiji and the subsequent Emperor Taisho did not sit well with Kita, like those to introduce a parliament, a modified system of democratic rule, and rapid industrialization alongside the formation of powerful business conglomerates known as Zaibatsu. The foundation of these changes was faulty in his mind, given that they were all based around an oligarchy, rather than just the emperor, or the emperor and all the men under his rule. After witnessing the formation in 1912 of the Republic of China, 
and further considering how to bring about a less corruptible form of government in his home country, Kita settled on the idea of a coup to overthrow the reigning regime. In 1919, Kita published perhaps his most famous work, a short book known as An Outline Plan for the Reorganization of Japan. This book laid out Kita's ideals at the time, explaining why the emperor must remain in power, but why the lower power given to his advisors and the parliament of the time must be wrested and given instead to the people and, more prominently, the military. While some of the principles written in Kita's reorganization plan don't appear fascistic on their own, the text would be read time and again in decades to come, forming a new foundation for military thought leading up to and throughout World War II. The reorganization plan was so influential, in fact, that when the communist movement mentioned in our episode on heroic purgatory began to falter in the 1960s, the student organization which provided much of its manpower, Zengakuren, turned to its ideas to understand how they could restructure themselves to be more successful. While on an abstract level, this makes the document sound like a pretty well-rounded plan for government takeover, it's important to remember what came of this work in the years to come. One critic even went so far as to call the reorganization plan the Mein Kampf of Showa ultra-nationalistic Japan, with Showa being the era from 1926 to 1989. Getting back to how arguably progressive some portions of Kita's plan sound in hindsight, the proposal for a new government argued that the citizenry of Japan, as well as its military forces, must ally with one another to overthrow the corrupt officials reigning over them. A quote-unquote true democracy would then be established, with the aforementioned universal male suffrage, meaning that legal decisions would be given to the men of the country. Women, meanwhile, were expected to remain wives, mothers, and homemakers, who need not deal with political matters. Japan would still be centered around the father figure of the emperor, as Kita argued that internal struggle would lead to external troubles, meaning war and unrest in the territories composing Japan's burgeoning empire. And this is the part where we get into the not-so-progressive part of the reorganization plan. When discussing Japan's empire, Kita used similar logic to that of the infamous white man's burden, a line of thought which was used to justify the European takeover of the nations of Africa. According to the white man's burden, the nations of Europe were inherently more advanced than those of Africa, and thus needed to move into the southern continent and civilize the peoples living there. Thus, under the guise of altruism, forces from all over Europe poured into Africa and seized control of the many nations within, reorganizing their governments as they saw fit, and in almost all cases, exploiting the native peoples. Along these same lines, Kita argued that the people of Japan, given the emperor's legendary godly lineage, were inherently greater than any of the other ethnicities of Asia. For this reason, he stated that it was unnecessary to attempt to emulate the more advanced nations of the West in government, and that the Japanese ought to instead create their own government which fit their needs specifically. Thus, he ended up with a reorganization plan which seemed to combine elements of liberalism, progressivism, and fascism without any sense of contradiction for his readers. Getting back to the European parallel, Kita argued that, using Japan's might in terms of military strength and moral righteousness, the country should expand its borders as far as possible in order to tame its Asian neighbors, so to speak. Through this train of thought, we can see just how and why Kita's philosophy became so influential within the Japanese military during this era, and why someone might compare the book to Mein Kampf. Jumping to the time during which coup d'etat occurs, we explore how Kita's philosophy was beginning to take hold during the 1930s. In 1932, the first major military coup of the era was attempted within Japan. As we covered in our episode on patriotism, the May 15th incident was relatively successful, seeing as how a group of naval officers assassinated the contemporary prime minister. This incident proved influential among military officers throughout the rest of the 1930s, given that all who had participated were found not guilty of their crimes, due to a colossal outpouring of civilian support for their cause. During our research for this video, we couldn't find any direct link between Ikikita and the League of Blood, 
the group responsible for the successful and attempted assassinations of the May 15th incident. However, given the timing and how widely read his plan for reorganization was, and the nationalistic principles that the League of Blood espoused in defense of their actions, it's understandable that Kiju Yoshida includes this event within the film Coup d'etat. Kita in a way condoned the killing of one's superiors if they were believed to be acting against the best interests of their subordinates and the people of Japan. Thus, the shared philosophy links this philosopher with the League of Blood, if not as literally as the film suggests. Kita did, however, appear to have a larger hand in the February 26th incident of 1936. While not physically involved in the attempted assassinations nor the military takeover initiated by the Corps of Officers responsible, Kita could be seen as the coach standing behind these men. Emboldened by the earlier May 15th incident, those of the February 26th incident sought to again assassinate a number of their military superiors, as well as government officials, including the Prime Minister. This time, however, almost all of these attempts failed, and the coup stalled for four days before falling apart completely. While Japan was already well into the throes of imperialism by this point, the higher-ups of both the military and the government saw the potential for harm with insubordinate actions like these. The court-martial following the February 26th incident was thus done privately to discourage sympathy on the part of the public and dissidents like this was clamped down on further. What's more, given that Kita's influential book had been read by men responsible for these incidents, as well as several other minor events, and given that Kita may have had direct contact with the men responsible for the maneuvers of 1936, he was also punished by the government. In 1937, Kita was put to death for what was deemed to be his part in the incident, with reports conflicting over whether he was executed by firing squad or hanging. Given Kita's significance to wartime Japanese nationalist thought, the film depicts his death in a heavily symbolic manner, utilizing the former method. As we've discussed throughout this entire examination of Yoshida's political trilogy, the cinematography of Kudata is absolutely striking, conveying as much about the characters in the story as the actual events being displayed. Without being directly told about it, we witness Kita's transition from a man into a myth and a martyr for the cause of Japanese nationalism. All throughout the film, Kita is rarely photographed when not at least half in shadow. His face is noticeably aged, showing him as a wizened old man, while his corporeal being slowly fades into myth. As he is being put to death, we are given his supposed actual last words as he is strikingly strung up on a crucifix before being shot. One of the officers in charge of his execution asks whether he would like to pronounce the typical long live the emperor of a soldier going to his death, only for Kita to say that he wouldn't be so flippant as to praise the emperor in death. These words haunt Kita's legacy to this day, with some level of debate being held over just what he meant by them. Whether he had been insincere in his emperor worship, he had felt betrayed, or something else entirely. The reason we won't go more in-depth with the photography here is because most of the tricks utilized by Yoshida in Coup d'etat were present throughout both of its predecessors. Essentially, Eros Plus Massacre and Heroic Purgatory were proving grounds where Yoshida and his cinematographer experimented with visual storytelling, learning what worked and what didn't in terms of confusing the visual space and framing some of the most unique shots we may have ever seen in film. Many of these techniques are carried over to Coup d'etat, with a new finesse being applied. At this point, the duo are no longer experimenting, but using well-honed skills from their bag of tricks. Perhaps the most experimental part of the film in this regard, then, is how relatively conventional it is. That's right. While the first two political films are notorious for how baffling they are in terms of space and time, Coup d'etat is actually fairly linear. Time is played with a bit, and the space of the film is expectedly weird, but we're not dealing with a tale of overlapping timelines, nor an examination of past, present, and future. Rather, Coup d'etat serves as a biography of sorts, explaining the backbone of Japan's imperial military ideology through a man who was fundamental in shaping its course. After such a bizarre journey full of confusion and madness, Coup d'etat is actually relatively refreshing in how straightforward it is, and in how well it punctuates the series. 
Eros Plus Massacre compared the anarchist movement of the 1920s with the student movement of the 1960s that was drawing to a close at the time of the film's release. Heroic Purgatory sought to examine how this student movement developed, and where it might be headed throughout the 70s and 80s. Kureta, meanwhile, told the life story of Ikikita, one of the men responsible for the ideology which put down the anarchist movement present in Eros Plus Massacre. Thus, the series forms something of a closed loop. The second and third films are more or less counterpoints to one another, with one looking to the future and the left, while the other looks to the past and the right. The first, meanwhile, serves as a bridge between the latter two, holding them more or less in balance. In this way, while we have covered several conceptual trilogies like this up to this point, Kiju Yoshida's political trilogy is notable for how well constructed it is. Whether this was intended by Yoshida, or simply built this way, or the other looks While there were any number of other political movements and ideologies present within Japan throughout the 20th century, the political trilogy serves as a great primer on the heavy hitters, so to speak. It's a strange yet lucid examination of the tensions present on the left and the right, between the anarchists, the communists, and the wartime fascists. Not everything that the trilogy's future portions contain would necessarily come true, but these films remain a remarkable time capsule of a sincerely tumultuous century in Japanese history. Each film has its own unique identity, while providing enough stylistic overlap to show how well constructed they are as a complete package. Let us know in the comments which of the films is your favorite if you've seen the trilogy. And if you haven't, be sure to check them out if you have any interest in the Japanese New Wave or the history of Japanese politics.